David Paulides was once a law enforcement officer who became an investigative author with his work on The Missing 411, a collection of books and documentaries covering a range of baffling disappearances within national parks and other wilderness areas. The Missing 411 can be traced back to a chance encounter with an off-duty park ranger who confided in David about some of the peculiar missing person cases that he was aware of in his park. David became interested, and as he began to explore these disappearances, he began to notice a pattern and outline some clear criteria. First of all, various things are ruled out and excluded, such as mental health issues, evidence of a voluntary absence, and animal predation. What qualifies are instances marked by the following. Inexplicable tracking difficulties by search dogs who in these cases will often just circle a particular area and sit down, despite being, in most instances, being brought to the exact spot the missing had been to. Sudden severe weather events which usually occur right after the person has gone missing. The individual will sometimes be found in an area that had been gone over by professional searchers dozens of times before. On occasion, the person that vanished will be found missing a piece of clothing, most notably the shoes. On the occasion that the missing has been found, they are sometimes completely disoriented and can't recall the time they'd spent missing. There are others, but these factors will be the focus of this video. Now, before we get into the first disappearance, I'd first just like to thank BetterHelp for being the paid partner of this video. Is something interfering with your happiness or preventing you from achieving your goals? Regardless of whether you have a clinical mental health issue like depression or anxiety, or if you're just a person who lives in this crazy world today who is going through a hard time, BetterHelp can help you connect with a credentialed therapist who is trained to listen and provide helpful, unbiased advice. BetterHelp is a platform that makes finding a therapist easier because it's online, it's remote, and by filling out a few questions, BetterHelp can match you to a professional therapist in as little as 48 hours in most cases. With BetterHelp, you can have your therapy sessions in a way that works for you, whether that's by phone call, video chat, or even by messaging, if you prefer that. There's a link in the description below and in the pinned comments. It's betterhelp.com forward slash missing void. Clicking that link helps support this channel, but it also gets you 10% off your first month so you can connect with a therapist and see if it helps you. If you don't think that the first therapist you're matched with is a good fit, BetterHelp makes it easy to switch to a new one at no additional cost. So, if you're struggling, consider online therapy with BetterHelp. Click the link in the description or visit betterhelp.com forward slash missing void. Thanks again to BetterHelp for supporting this channel. Now let's begin on the edge of Yosemite National Park. Harry Mahoney was a 21-year-old college student attending the San Benito Junior College. What we know of Harry is that he was an intelligent young man and was becoming quite the accomplished athlete. He was in great shape and served as the president of the student body at the college and was said to have displayed good leadership qualities. While specific details about his background are hazy, this suggests that it's likely that he was well regarded among his peers and faculty. On the 18th of December, 1925, Harry, along with two of his good friends who had attended Hollister High School with him, Jeff Newkirk and Russell Hawkins set out on a bear hunting trip in the Sierra Nevada mountains, right on the border of Yosemite National Park. The group wanted to do something together during the holiday season in the build up to Christmas. So, on the morning of the day in question, they chose to set up their camp near a place called Hazel Green and Gin Flat. Gin Flat is not too far away from Yosemite Valley. They stayed there for a while and made some plans as to how they wanted to proceed. They thought it best to split up for the day to cover more ground and to increase the likelihood of finding a black bear, or at least the tracks of one. Jeff, who was on the eager side, was the first to leave camp already knowing the area he wanted to prowl, while Harry and Russell continued talking. Jeff was completely out of sight and well underway when the pair decided to travel together a couple of hours later. They had decided to hunt closer together and split up once they'd travelled around one mile from the camp. 
but they were still in the same zone, whereas Jeff was away from them. They had all agreed to meet back up at camp at around 5pm. As each of them waded through the forest in their respective areas, they didn't realise that the weather was about to become severe. A snowstorm was about to engulf the entire mountain with a thick layer of snow. Jeff made it back to camp first, and he was immediately worried and on edge because of the sudden change in weather. At this stage, it was only snowing lightly, but he knew that it was about to get much worse. His two partners were well versed with their survival skills, and they knew to return to camp in such a situation, so he waited patiently for them to arrive. Russell was delayed, but he made it back after the 5pm deadline, and they waited for their final member to return. After two hours had passed, they both had a bad feeling as the snow began to fall faster and faster, so they re-entered the forest alongside one another looking for Harry. They travelled in the direction that Harry and Russell had initially gone and began calling his name, but they received no response. During this search, panic set in and they began to eject a series of loud, echoing shells into the air to pierce through the snowy landscape. Their hope was that these bursts of noise would carry across the vastness of the land, serving as a beacon for Harry to navigate his way back to them. Russell claims they ejected 60 shots. No answering signal from Harry was heard. Russell and Jeff said they felt sure Harry would find his way back, as he was well trained in scout law and should have made camp before the snowstorm started. On a hunting trip, Harry obviously had the means of defending himself. When they didn't hear a response, they knew their search was futile and that it was time to bring in the rangers, which is exactly where they headed next. The pair were now absolutely exhausted as they'd been trekking all over the place constantly for hours and hours at this point, and now the rangers needed them to guide them to the place that Harry was last seen. Altogether, this now turned into a group of 25, mostly consisting of rangers and professional searchers. But there were volunteers too, and now the word began to spread. These 25 men repeated the search already made by Russell and Jeff, though managed to cover further ground. It seems that there was a belief, and a hope, that with the ground they could cover, they would find footprints to lead them to him. But that did not happen. In fact, all they really found was an absolute silence other than the sounds of the storm and the snow crunching beneath their boots. Harry is still missing today after being lost for three days in the High Sierras. Harry disappeared before daylight Friday morning when he became separated from two companions during a snowstorm, which poured down a foot of snow in less than eight hours. It was thought that Harry could not have wandered far before the snowstorm cleared, and it is feared that he met with an accident and is now in some inaccessible spot. It wasn't mentioned how many searchers were there, other than the scale of the search was intensifying with time. But what's interesting here is the fact that the professional searchers did not believe that he could have gotten very far because of the snowstorm. Despite that, they couldn't locate a trace of him anywhere, and the search dogs were running into issues too as they just couldn't find a scent. I'd imagine in this case though, that the snowstorm, coupled with winds, must have made that a rather difficult task for the dogs to undertake. But nevertheless, they were of no help here. The snow is not deep, permitting the rapid search. According to his friend, Harry is dressed warmly. The searchers hope to find him today. If they do not succeed, they will almost abandon hope of finding him alive. What was being communicated, effectively, was that Harry could not have been completely buried by the snow, as it just wasn't deep enough for that. I'd imagine that this must have added to the confusion, in regards to the fact that they just couldn't find him anywhere. In addition to that, the search leaders did not believe that Harry had fallen prey to an animal, and there were no signs of that either. As I've said a number of times across the channel, when animal predation has occurred, it usually becomes quite obvious, as without being too descriptive, there is basically just a scatter. The next article I came across described that Harry's relatives, friends, and the search party at large was at a loss for an explanation as to what happened to him. They also said that it was puzzling that he must have somehow travelled outside of the search radius before passing away. 
The search was then called off and there was a radio silence until June of 1926, six months after Harry vanished. The parents of Harry Mahoney, whose skeleton was revealed to search asunder through the melting snows near Gin Flat, will demand a complete investigation of his passing, reports today indicated. The body was found by Roscoe Wright and William Scover, friends of the boy's parents, at the bottom of a steep precipice. It was lying flat on the ground, Wright said. One arm crossed over the chest and the other pinned underneath. There was an abrasion on the left shoulder and doctors who examined the body said it could have been impaled. Following the verdict of a coroner's jury, it was concluded that Harry had met with an accidental end through causes unknown. The fact that Harry's sweater was found 10 feet away from the body caused the mother to believe that her son could not have passed away of cold or exposure. To be clear, Harry's body was found in an area that had been searched multiple times during the official search in December of 1925. The family felt that foul play must have occurred in this case, presumably because of what the doctor had said about the possible impalement on the left shoulder, and the fact that he'd been found in an area already gone over multiple times, insinuating that he may have been placed there after the fact. Of course, it is possible that he may have been buried in the snow, though the searchers at the time didn't believe it was deep enough to obscure a body completely. There's some weirdness to this also, because about six days prior to the body being found, this was stated in the Stockton Independent on the 9th. A tip given by a Montreal clairvoyant has found a newly opened grave near Hazel Green, from which a body has recently been removed and numerous evidences that the body was Harry's. Four empty cartridges were found near the newly opened grave. Detectives had found Harry's red sweater at a ranch some distance away. It seems that what happened here is that Harry's family had employed two detectives to continue searching for him and they, through a clairvoyant, came across these supposed findings. However, I can't imagine they were correct, especially in regards to the sweater, because Harry's sweater was found 10 feet away from his body on the 15th. It could have been the case that because of the contrast of these findings, speculations were running wild because on the 15th, on the same day it was reported that his body was found, another newspaper, the Sacramento Bee, stated this. Near to where the body was found, a shallow grave was discovered. It was believed probable that Harry was met with foul play, and the slayers later removing it and placing it at the point of discovery. It's not clear to me that the two articles are even talking about the same grave because the detectives then said that they found his red sweater at a ranch somewhere. Harry's body was found nowhere near a ranch, so it's difficult to know what to make of that. Though it is interesting that the clairvoyant mentioned a grave, if in fact there was a shallow one next to the site of his remains. But because two different sites were being mentioned by the detectives and by the people who actually found the remains, it's now difficult to know if the grave was just speculation that was being passed around and exaggerated. Also, if there were four empty cartridges left behind by Harry next to this supposed shallow grave, you'd have thought that Russell and Jeff might have heard this commotion go down. Lie detector tests were a new experimental thing at this time, and Jeff took one and passed when stating that he had nothing to do with it. But Russell's parents wouldn't let him take one, citing some concerns about how they didn't believe that they were very accurate. The distance from the campsite to the point that Harry's remains were found wasn't mentioned specifically, but the public opinion newspaper stated that it was not far away. That must have been the case if the site had been searched multiple times already, insinuating that it was well within the search radius. There were two camps of thought. Because Harry's red sweater had been removed, there were those who thought that he must have succumbed to hypothermia after a fall and others who took the abrasion of the shoulder to the realm of foul play. The exact cause of his passing was never determined outside of causes unknown, and we're left with a set of unusual circumstances. There is clearly missing information here somewhere, because the circumstances we're left with are somewhat incongruent. The searchers didn't believe that there was enough snow to cover the body, yet it was later found in an area that had been searched. Russell and Jeff did not hear any commotion, despite the fact that it seems that Harry had left behind four empty cartridges, 
Did he find a bear or was he threatened by someone? I have no idea what was going on with the mention of a grave because I couldn't find any official mentions of that by the authorities. So it's not clear if that was just speculation led on by the clairvoyance and then being printed by the press. Anyway, there's not a great conclusion to be had for this one, but at this point I've basically exhausted all of the information in regards to Harry and there doesn't really appear to be a consensus on what happened to him. Every article referred to this incident as a puzzle in one sense or another. What do you think? Before we move on to the second disappearance, YouTube indicates that approximately only 38% of viewers are subscribed to the channel. If you enjoy the content and haven't subscribed yet, please consider doing so as it helps me a lot. I'd appreciate that very much. Now, let's move on to the next disappearance at Lake Wenatchee State Park. I'm counting this one under the umbrella of national parks because the only real difference between a state park and a national park is the governing body associated with it. Some national parks used to be state parks. Lake Wenatchee though is a glacier and snowmelt fed lake which is situated in the Wenatchee National Forest on the eastern slopes of the Cascade Mountain Range. This would be the location that Hildegard Hendrickson would disappear in June of 2013. Hildegard first came to the United States of America many years prior to her disappearance at 79 years old. She came from Germany to attend college in the States where she ended up achieving not only her bachelors but her masters and doctorate also at the University of Washington. Hildegard was a deeply intelligent woman who came to have a passion for mycology and ended up working at the Center for Urban Horticulture it was said that she could quite literally identify any and all mushrooms, including the rarer types that would be brought to the site. On the 8th of June that year, Hildegard drove to an area 15 miles from Lake Wenatchee and parked near the Minnow Creek Trailhead, near Basalt Peak in the early afternoon. The year prior to her visit, there had been some wildfires in the area, and wild mushroom patches are often known to grow in areas that have suffered this. She was hoping to find, collect, and study whatever mushrooms that might have sprung up there. In her older age, while she didn't have any ailments that I came across, she couldn't get around like she used to in her younger years. Which is a factor that makes her disappearance just that much more unusual. Hildegard came into contact with a number of people that day along the general trail that she was slowly and steadily hiking. Other mushroom hunters were also in the area that day who conversed with her for a brief moment and she told them that she was solo hiking that day. A forest service employee also confirmed her presence on the day in question, stating that he had seen her on the trail. And finally, a cardiologist, Dr. Anthony Okos, saw her. He would later tell the county detectives that he tried to advise her that the trail was quite steep and that she might want to reconsider hiking it. He was worried that the trail might have been somewhat challenging for the now 79 year old, but Hildegard assured him that she would be fine and that she hiked several times a week safely. So, she set off down the trail, equipped with her blue metallic walking stick and her mushroom basket, and she began the ascent on the trail. Little did she or anyone else know that this would be the very last time that she would ever be seen again. At some point on that trail, while completely alone, something must have gone so completely awry that it caused her total disappearance. It wasn't noticed that something was wrong at first, but three days later, another mushroom hunter noticed that her car had been in the same spot for that entire time. He also realised that it was unlocked and that Hildegard's purse was still sat on the seat. He opened the car and found her driver's license and immediately called 911, fearing that she might have found herself in some difficulty. The search began on the same day that she was reported missing and bloodhound teams were immediately brought to the car. After collecting her profile and getting accounts from her family, it was felt that she would be found rather quickly as she wasn't in any condition to be venturing off the trails, at least not very far, but something and it's not clear what exactly must have happened to her because the search dogs not once found her scent down the trail, despite the fact that we know that she had definitely been right there along it. The search party would come to consist of deputies, professional search and rescuers, and many volunteers. 
The dogs were taken along the entire length of the trail multiple times and ventured off beyond the trail all over the place, but not once did they get a hint of her scent. When these grid searches continued to fail, a helicopter with thermal imaging technology was brought in and flew overhead, but this also failed to find her heat signature. There was an odd report from one of the searchers who heard what he described as a whistling sound, but he never found the source of it. Apparently, a number of searchers were sent in the direction of this sound. Perhaps the thought might have been that Hildegard was making it, but nothing ever came of that. I'm also not sure why she would be whistling and not shouting if that was her. It was just never understood where that noise was coming from, though the searcher in question did find it strange. The county sheriff's deputy, Jean Ellis, described it as the largest search effort he'd seen in his 24-year career with the department. He said that it was bizarre that they never found any clues, had no leads or suspects, and there was just no trace left behind at all of Hildegard. This was unsettling and highly unusual for a number of reasons. Firstly, while Hildegard could hike well enough, she did need to use her walking stick. So it was thought that she really shouldn't have been able to get very far away. Secondly, the Sheriff's Sergeant Kent Sisso said that they had looked at the possibility of foul play, but were having a hard time finding a motive. He effectively made the point that her personal belongings had just been left untouched in her unlocked car. Some kind of animal attack had been ruled out as there were just no signs of that anywhere. The mountains in the area were very steep and her climbing up them just wasn't feasible so they quite literally had exhausted all reasonable possibilities as to where to search. Here are some interesting comments made by people in the same year that she vanished. I think possibly there could have been some commercial mushroom pickers that Hildegard wasn't fond of in the area that could have taken exception to a comment that she may have made. That's just my best guess, that something out of the ordinary happened to make her disappear or that someone helped her disappear, but there's no evidence of that. It was a hard sight to get lost in, and you didn't have to walk far to find mushrooms. It just doesn't add up. At this point, you have to look at foul play. Kent Sisso, after exploring the possibility of foul play, later stated that she must be near the trail somewhere. But in that instance, you really would have thought that the dogs would have led the searchers right to her. It's difficult to reconcile that. I do wonder what was going on with the whistling. And what was that about? Could that have been an attempt made by one of the commercial mushroom pickers warning others in their group of the presence of the searchers? It's not really clear, but there is a legal limit to the amount that you're allowed to pick, and apparently there's a lot of financial interest at play here. So there are groups that go in and forage far more than they're actually allowed to. That is speculation of course, but just the fact that there was a whistling sound is quite odd though it doesn't necessarily mean that it had anything to do with Hildegard's disappearance. In any case, even 10 years later now at this point, Hildegard's body has never been found, and it's never been understood what happened to her that day. At this point, I wanted to highlight a disappearance involving missing shoes and a lack of memory as to the time spent missing. I did scour some older newspapers looking for a case like this that took place in a national park, but unfortunately, I couldn't find one and I ran out of time. I have, however, covered many such cases outside of national parks, so I've revoiced and re-edited a case that I covered over a year ago involving these very circumstances. It was a cold, foggy morning when Judy Roden Call, 16 years old, disappeared from rural Washara County, Wisconsin. Judy lived with her parents in a remote farmhouse in the small town of Auroraville, this day though, right at the very end of October 1956, would be like no other, and something unusual would take place on the Rodenkarl family farm. That morning, like all others, Judy would get up early and prepare herself for school that day, but for some reason, she would never make it to the school bus, nor the school. Officers turned out with volunteers today in an aircraft-led search for Judy. Described by the sheriff's office as a nice, quiet girl with a steady boyfriend. The boyfriend, who was not identified, helped spur the search Tuesday night when he arrived at the farmhouse. The sheriff's office reported that Judy left her home for school that morning 
but did not get on the school bus. She later was seen about noon near her home. From what I'm able to ascertain, that sighting wasn't confirmed, I don't believe. Just that someone thought they saw Judy, so it's not completely clear if it was her or not. A couple of questions immediately entered the mind of the sheriff. Firstly, the question as to whether or not this might have been purposeful arose. The family had stated that she was in great spirits and seemed excited for school that day, and her boyfriend said something similar, to the effect of her seeming happy. After these statements were made, the sheriff's office immediately realised that something wasn't right here and began to suspect foul play. But after searching the heavily wooded and swampy areas surrounding the farmhouse, they hadn't uncovered any evidence of this. But the sheriff said that was still the theory that they were proceeding the investigation with. Now, the first day of searching uncovered nothing, but the second day would reveal something odd. The investigation into the strange disappearance of Judy Rodenkarl reached an impasse today as officers sought new leads. Willow Creek was dragged, but no evidence of her presence was found. The dragging operators were confined to the east side of Highway 49, where bloodhounds late Wednesday led the officers. The creek, which is generally shallow on that side of the highway, was dragged for about half a mile. The bloodhounds led officers to a bridge over the creek after giving a scent from two socks, identified as belonging to Judy. The socks and a handkerchief were found Wednesday about a mile north and west of the Rodin home. The authorities went on to state that these items showed no sign of foul play but they also had absolutely no idea what was even happening here. The bloodhounds led the searchers to the socks nearby this body of water, but then the trail went cold and the dogs could no longer follow a scent. They sat down and became uninterested at that very spot. This obviously led to the dragging of the Willow Creek, but as said, it became clear that she wasn't in there. It seems that a lot of hope was placed on the dogs here, but they weren't able to track her beyond that point. So, for some reason that isn't clear, Judy travelled over a mile from her home and then removed her shoes and socks, but the shoes were never located. What's particularly interesting about this too, is that no one seemed to have any idea as to what was going on here. Some people were sticking to the idea that foul play was involved, while others just didn't know and thought this finding was odd. The air of confusion surrounding this incident would end up inviting many additional people to help search who wanted to figure out what had happened to her. Huge crowds of curious spectators jammed the village late Wednesday afternoon and evening. This morning, scores of cars were seen in the village, but there was no organised search and Officer Fritz said he did not know of any plans for additional searches unless some new lead was received. The bloodhounds were brought in from Lacrosse, handled by their owner. Twice, they followed the same route from the spot where the socks were found to the side of the creek just east of the bridge. It was at that spot that they became uninterested, whatever that means. Presumably just sitting down and not able to find the scent again. Or I suppose, may have been sat at the very end of the scent trail. Though I'm not sure how that makes any sense if she wasn't in the water. It's also strange that the search was reaching its conclusion so early but it was stated that this entire area had now been searched by hundreds of people and she just wasn't there. Now, if we're not already there, let's get bizarre. Judy, missing for nearly 60 hours, stumbled out of the woods and fell unconscious at the door of a farmhouse Thursday night. Judy was found by farmer Edgar Tim as he walked from the barn to his home. He summoned authorities who brought her to hospital. Her physician, Dr. David Seavers, said that she was in good condition, but suffering from shock and exposure. Police said Judy was unable to answer questions when she reached the hospital and there was no information on how she had spent the hours since she disappeared. That is simply bizarre. Judy stumbled out of the woods, which had already been thoroughly searched, fell unconscious and had no memory at all of her time spent missing. The sheriff stated that it appeared that she was alone for the entire time that she'd vanished. He also tried to explain away the incident by stating that she might have spent the entire time in an outbuilding on Edgar's farm. But she simply had absolutely no idea of what her 60 hours missing looked like. What was interesting too was the fact that she was found barefoot 
and unlike her socks, the dogs and searchers never came across the shoes. They weren't in the water at Willow Creek, they weren't anywhere on Edgar's farm, the repeated searches of the wooded areas didn't uncover them either while looking for her, and the dogs never came across them. What even happened here? This whole ordeal is just creepy and weird. No one had any great answers here, including Judy, who didn't remember anything. What do you think? I would very much like to hear your thoughts on all of the incidents discussed throughout this video, so please do let me know in the comments below. With that, I'd just like to take the time to thank you for watching, and a big thank you to the patrons who've been running around on the screen. If you'd like to become a patron to support the channel and have your name running around too, then please do visit the link in the description below. If you found the video interesting, then please do leave a like and a comment, hit the bell and subscribe if you haven't already. These things help me an awful lot. If not, then feel free to leave a dislike. I'm happy to hear your honest opinion either way. I hope that you've had a great day or evening, depending on where you are, and I'll see you in the next one. Be safe guys. Peace.